Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 80. Before we get into today's conversation, I want to say that it has been one whole year since I launched the Patreon page for the Journaling with Nature podcast. There are some folks who signed up right away and have been supporting the show for this entire year, and there are others who signed up along the way to offer their support. To all of my patrons, I want to send out a huge and heartfelt thank you, because it's your support that makes this podcast possible. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast and you'd like to show your support for as little as $1 per month, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash journaling with nature. Thank you again to all the Patreon supporters. So now I'm smiling as I get ready to introduce today's guest because she is someone with so much infectious enthusiasm for what she does. Amy Schlesser is a science educator who uses art, storytelling, and video to simplify and communicate complex ideas. If you attended this year's Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference, you may have taken Amy's workshop, which was called Doodling Diagrams. In her class, Amy guided us through the process of looking at tricky things like the movement of animals and taking the important information and putting it into simple and easy to understand sketches. In our conversation, we spoke about a major transition Amy went through in high school, the different ways that she combines art and science in her professional life, and how nature journaling is helping her see the landscape of her childhood with new eyes. Let's listen. Amy, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you so much, Bethan. Um, I've been super excited about it all day today and listened to things yesterday um, from the podcast. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for thinking of me and asking me to, to be on the podcast. Oh, well, you you were an obvious choice for me because I love what you do and I'm really excited to dig into it with you. But first, I always ask my guests about their early exposure to nature, early nature experiences. And I wonder if nature's been with you from the beginning? Yeah, a lot of, um, most of the nature I experienced as a kid was like backyard nature, Mm -hmm. right? So, um, and getting a little obsessed about like, whoa, there's anthills, what? And, uh, you know, watching ants for hours and then probably picking through their anthill, unfortunately, and (laughs) looking at the tunnels. Um, (laughs) Or, you know, even like house uh, daddy long legs. Uh, We had the kids had free range of the basement that was unfinished and like you leave your toys there for a night and like there's daddy long legs everywhere so my strategy at some point is like i can't be scared of that i like i will hold one in my hand to conquer my fear and then i won't <laughs> care as much so um but yeah things like you know squirrels in the backyard or this giant willow tree that i was really proud of because it was the tallest tree in our neighborhood and somehow that made me it was a very special tree um so yeah a lot of a lot of uh backyard things or um my grandparents had a farm so there were um I don't know I remember the insects and grasshoppers most uh, and how I caught them in jars and accidentally fried them in the sun nothing nothing (laughs) great there and then I was scared of grasshoppers for a long time um and and yeah some like catching frogs with you know at my school um and yeah essentially um a lot of the places that we happened to like go on vacation um everything was very flat so kind of like a four seasons midwestern uh flat kind of like backyard suburbs Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, my parents weren't too into camping or anything like I went camping for the first time when I was 20 and to kind of like a more natural park area like when I was in high school um those early experiences with critters are really important yeah. by the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I know I that was a lot of my early childhood. And then there was a point where like I stopped playing in the backyard, <laughs> you know, and I didn't really 
get out in nature any other way. So, um, you know, I stopped yeah. being around nature for a while. Of like my, we lived on like a, a corner, a corner of two streets and it was really easy to see in our backyard and I didn't want to be spotted there, you know, playing in the yeah. dirt. So, you know, it gets a little odder, but uh, nature journaling is all about playing in the dirt. So it's so exciting. <laughs> That yeah. seems to be a bit of a theme with folks that there's a nature exposure in early childhood and then maybe sometimes people have a period in the middle of uh, teen years or early 20s where they do other things and then but those that those early experiences stick with you and you can revisit them later when you've done the teen angst thing for for a little <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, it was fun reflecting back and thinking, and uh, I, I got a got an advance warning that you might be asking me something about this. So I was like, yeah, what is, is what was my uh, childhood nature? Because I was like, you know, it was nothing. Like, I, I didn't yeah. have nature in my life at all. And I was like, well, no, there were definitely things like in your backyard. It could be a very rich place full of little critters. So it was fun thinking back on those. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a backyard nature time as well you know not nothing grand not great big um national parks necessarily but those those things can be really significant you know suburban nature experiences in childhood can be significant I'm wondering about art was art part of your life as well um Yes. So my mom is uh, quite a good artist. Um, she drew a lot in high school. And when I was a little kid, um, sometimes I think she'd probably like draw little pictures for me to color in like a coloring book mm -hmm. or something, but she could draw um, horses, like realistic looking horses from memory. And I was just like, how are you doing that, mom? That doesn't make any sense. Like how? And she's like, well, I used to draw horses a lot. So I kind of remember this. And I really wanted, I was like, teach me, tell me how you do this. So um, she, she brought out like a photo book of horses and drew a grid on it and then drew a grid on a piece of paper. Um, and I don't know, something that like, I kind of formally learned in like high school, but she was like teaching me this as like an eight yeah. year old. And uh, we sat there many, many days um, of, you know, focusing on a square at a time and being very frustrated. And I can't believe she had the patience because like I probably <laughs> like cried some days because it was so hard, but I still wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I um, actually, I have it on my wall. It's like a, oh, a nice. horse I drew when I was uh, very young. And then, you know, I learned some skill after that you see in my like art books and other things my dad saved from my childhood of um still a lot of doodling um but kind of l learning when i wanted to i was like i'm gonna look at a picture i'm gonna try to draw it realistically and having like some of those early tools um yeah that i could that, yeah that that helped me so go mom thank you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then when you went to college you studied fine arts and i wonder was that an obvious choice when you were choosing your colleges? Or was it a natural choice for you? Um, not really. I wasn't sure if I was going to go to college, probably community college. Um, but yeah, I I was I kind of always wanted to be a teacher. Um, low key, I was like maybe a math teacher. I don't know. Um, and I was actually talking to my sister about it, and she's like, "Well, Dal, you love art." And you love to, you want to be a teacher, like, why don't you be an art teacher? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, and I had a great teacher in high school who um, invited like a college admissions counselor or something like that um, from some local colleges to actually talk to us, in which I, you know, first realized, oh, right, there are art schools and kind of being like, I really don't have money to go to maybe any college like this college so like just talking to them very seriously about like hey give it to me real like do i have any <laughs> chance of getting any kind of scholarship like should i actually try this um so so yeah i got lucky and decided that i would go um to school to become an art teacher and then in college there was a big transition that happened for you. And I'd love for you to talk about that, about finding science and how that came to be that, uh, so maybe you can start off talking yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was uh, actually more in, in high school. Yeah. Okay, in so, high school. Um, yeah, um, so, so when I was, you know, like a young kid, I um, I grew up in a community that didn't believe in um, evolution or, 
uh, the Big Bang or kind of believed things like, uh, you know, men and dinosaurs lived at the same time um, or that the Earth is quite young. Um, and so and and we still had like science class, of course, in my in my like schools, um, in my home school, a lot of it was about like uh, modern animals or habitats, um, things like that. Um, I one one important lesson I remember um, from being a kid was one day we went out and drew goldenrod flowers and labeled them, and I was like, oh my gosh, that was like the first time nature journal. Like, um, but essentially, yeah. Um, as yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, but but yeah, I wouldn't say I was super into science, but I liked animals and stuff. Um, but especially when um, when high school kind of started, or kind of maybe middle school, um, there was it was very clear that like science was kind of a thing that you shouldn't really trust um, in my in my community, and kind of to be suspicious of it. Um, and you know, teachers being you know like, where are you getting? your information from just um so so yeah i i was um very much a, a creationist and following uh, my parents and schools and educators beliefs um until somewhere around high school when i started um questioning things a little i'm like what <laughs> yeah so i mean um when high school started, I went to a, I went to a public school. I um, kind of was separated from a lot of the friends I'd made, um, other than my mom, who um, held those same, uh, you know, who was a steady presence in my life of, of creationist beliefs. Um, it wasn't my teachers anymore, so that was that was really interesting. Um, a little bit in high school about, um, you know, my my freshman year biology class, talking a little bit about like when do we think life starts? You know, there's different theories on that, or you know, getting a little bit into maybe just cell evolution or something. Um, but even even doing something uh, like a a big influence, I think, was when um, a science teacher had us do a research paper or a opinion paper kind of of whether or not we believed in global warming warming and then support it uh, with evidence from different sources we looked up. Um, and so I wrote the paper with like the thesis of, yeah, like global warming is not real um, and or like, what was it? It was something like global warming happens and has happened many times in the past. So it might be real, but it's not caused by humans or something like that, right? Um, and so that was like my thesis. I did a bunch of research on, you know, the school computers, and I was having such a hard time finding sources to support that. Um, and it was it was so fascinating because it like they were there if you really dug into them, but there was like there was it would have been so much easier to do the paper on the other side because it was like you know it was just so clear like it was everywhere the evidence was everywhere and so so it was kind of like huh um, and. I when when I was a kid, perhaps we I don't recall ever directly talking about global warming with my teachers and whether that was uh, true or false. But I think I I still just had it ingrained, um, kind of anti or like science suspicion. So that was like probably maybe you know maybe it's false. I can't remember people talking about it. Um, so I knew that existed, and I always thought it was a uh, kind of not 50 50 but you know like that that it was a big uh debate perhaps um and kind of doing that paper kind of made me realize like it's there's like a tiny bit of some sources that are disagreeing but like it is overwhelmingly um uh, you know uh so so it's so interesting um and so i ended up uh writing the paper about uh global warming um not being real or like man-made um but by the end of it i, I just did that because i'd done all the research <laughs> by the end of it i i believe that you know global warming is probably real um that makes sense um so that was really interesting i actually never told my science teacher that that <laughs> he had a profound influence i just i just turned in the paper that said it was real and um th and that was very important too of having people who you know, he let us, he let me write that. He never treated me any different. He never said, huh, so you wrote about it, being, you know, and I, I never mentioned to him like, hey, I don't actually believe that, but I wrote that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, just having these really positive adults in your life who know, um, or who, who you know, believe other things than you do, but who are still uh, very non-judgmental, but, you know, help you maybe look at different sources and other things. Um, so that, um, so yeah, that, that had a big, influence in my life about perhaps um trusting science a little mm. a little more um doing some of my own research and or you know just being exposed to a different community perhaps that um 
you know, didn't, uh, wasn't a creationist community. Um, and yeah, it was a very interesting time of not a big talking too much. Yeah. Oh, a huge change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I was, things like creation was, were like very important to me. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a major change and a big kind of like life shift. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so from, from studying fine art, now you work at, you call you, you described yourself as a visual storyteller of science. And I love that way of describing your job. You've developed science exhibits, science videos for kids, science curriculum. I'd love to hear more about these opportunities for communicating about science that you've had in your professional life. Yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been, I mean, thinking about where I started <laughs> and not liking science or being suspicious of it and now being like, yeah, I have a science uh, career. I'm a science educator. And it's just, um, it's, it's so cool. I'm so lucky, I think, to, um, to have the job and jobs that I've had. Um, and uh, so let's see. Yeah, I was studying art in, art in college, but one of my favorite things really were the, the science classes and math classes that I um, was able to take. It was interesting if like, if you only have art classes, which mainly we did, like, what am I going to make my art about? <laughs> like, I need something really inspiring. Um, yeah. So yeah, and so I was really, I was making a lot of art about, about, um, about math, about in high school, I was making a lot of art about why you believe the things that you believe and um, where, where your information comes from kind of playfully. Um, but yeah, and like trigonometry, how does trigonometry make you feel? I was doing like pop quizzes, um, <laughs> surprise tests, audience participation, that kind of thing, um, which is very fun. Um, but essentially, um, you know, my, my school was in the end focused on art education classes because I wanted to be a teacher. Um, I realized that my gosh, teachers have it so hard, um, <laughs> so, so hard. Um, and I was like, I do not want to be a teacher, uh, but what do I do with my education degree? Um, I had a professor that said, um, you know, like why you could look into education behind the scenes, kind of, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> like museums, et cetera. And so I ended up getting a um, internship um, at a museum doing kind of three, uh, what was it, 3D modeling of like installation cases and artifacts and and such. So, which I didn't have too much experience with. That was, that was lucky in itself. Um, and so I, and that was at the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, and I eventually applied for a job being kind of more of a, a writer there. Um, so I realized um, when I was designing things, I really wanted to know more about like what it was, like, the specimen, you know, I'm placing them. I'm trying to think carefully about materials and and light levels and whatever. But like, I'm like, I really want to know the story behind these things, and you know, why is this so cool? And I wanna, I wanna talk to the people doing the research and stuff. And kind of realized, ooh, this would be a really fun job as well. So yeah, there were a couple paths at the museum of doing, say, um, design work or more um, writing and development, storytelling. Um, and so I applied for an open position um, as the an exhibition developer, so storyteller, uh, writer. And somehow, again, I got very lucky um, without much experience um, um, being able to get that job. Um, and it was, it was so amazing to get to work with scientists um, and, and just science communicators. And I'd never done that before and it was it was so fascinating to learn about it was also a little strange you know I talked to my boss about like you know I don't have a big background in science I definitely (laughs) I'm like I definitely did not tell anyone at first at least um about my my creationist background like I didn't even believe in this stuff till like four years ago no um but (laughs) but yeah I was just kind of like you know I'm I I don't you know I don't have a deep background in science I don't have a science degree and he was you know telling me that you know, our audience are members of the general public who also, um, we're not expecting them that they have a deep knowledge of science either, but are interested in science isn't like the museum visitors. Um, and that, and that, you know, we have to, we have to start there, you know, and assume like, what, what, what does it take for them to, to understand something? What actually interests them? What, you know, how do they, um, get, get to learning and what do they want to know? Um, and so I, I essentially was doing that process myself, um, yeah. when talking to scientists and, and coworkers and stuff and seeing what it took, you know, what it was taking me to learn, say about biomechanics, which is one of my, <laughs> um, bigger projects there. Um, 
and then knowing like then how to explain it or what I found really exciting, et cetera, of just like, it's okay to be a member of the general public <laughs> um, yes. and being a science communicator because you're learning things and then you're telling other members of the general public about what you, what you learned um, and how you learned it and what you were excited about. So um, it was, yeah, it was a, it was a unique and cool uh, position to be in definitely. Um, and right before, right before I um, left the museum, I was able to, kind of host just like a lunch and learn um or discussion that um people occasionally did it was it was a thing that happened there and so I did one um just talking about being an ex-creationist um and because some people at happy hour were like what you used to you know that's really interesting yeah. um you should talk about that so I did and it was um it was fascinating we with a with a great you know conversation um it was also so interesting to to learn more about scientists themselves and you know really mm-hmm. thinking of them as um kind of, you know, geniuses are just like so smart and knowing like all the things and then kind of realizing like, but scientists have to pick like a very small area of focus. <laughs> like yes. the scientist I was mainly working on an exhibit about biomechanics, like um, was doing most of his work on fish jaws and specifically the fish jaws of a sling jaw, sling jaw rat, <laughs> which like live in the Red Sea. And that was like his thing, you know? So he was yes. so, so, you know, it's so fascinating. He was a professor of biomechanics and, but he'd also put us in touch with other experts in bio, you know, you know? and so, so it was really interesting to, um, to actually get to work with scientists, see them as everyday people. Um, and, yes. you know, obviously who had done so much studying and were, were very smart and capable, but like, um, yeah, just to, you know, be able to drink some beers with them at happy hour and, um, you know, just to, just to get to know them um, was, was a really uh, great experience. Yeah. And then after the Field Museum, where I am now, I am um, creating science curriculum for kindergarten through fifth graders with um, a really amazing team of science dorks um, again as well. Um, <laughs> so much fun I'm doing um, in the museum. It was kind of like you could do kind of art and design or um, writing and storytelling. This has been really nice in my new job in that I am kind of the lead visual storyteller, uh, but it it was such a small team, especially at the beginning, it was a startup um, that, you know, I got to, I do, um, you know, I get to help edit scripts. I'm very involved in that process. One of the products that we make, I wrote as well as do the visual. So um, it's a way to get your hands in a little of everything, which is uh, really exciting. Yeah, I love that. I really love the word storytelling. I think it evokes a whole lot of things. I think that telling and listening to stories is just so much a part of what it is to be human. And I wonder what storytelling, what does the word storytelling evoke for you? What do you, what does it mean to you? Part of storytelling is not just starting with the answer, like reading Mm -hmm. a mystery novel and not just Mm -hmm. finding out, (laughs) flipping to the end. It's like going through the process and, you know, if it was a mystery novel, you're, you're finding out the clues. You don't know, want to know who the killer is. And, you know, you don't want to just flip towards the last page of the book. Um, And so, and yeah, it's really, it's really getting at what is, interesting to people and what's hooking them in, you know, why would they want to know this, you know, science, uh, science fact, you know, not, not starting with the answer of like, Mm -mm. clouds are made of water vapor, but starting with like the curiosity of like, and clouds are weird. Like there's these white things floating in the sky. What in the world could they be made of? Like if I could touch a cloud, would it feel like, like warm cotton candy or smoke or what is it, you know? Um, And so, so yeah, really storytelling and like storytelling, again, the idea of, well, it can, it can just be words, but to me, uh, storytelling is really tied into, to pictures yes. as well. Um, so even, even things like um, doing an exhibit on, you know, biomechanics, which is, you know, biology and mechanics, so kind of like the inner working of living things and how they function and all that kind of fun stuff. Like even when we're explaining like how a Venus flytrap works, it's not just um, you know, if you touch one hair, this happens, or these yes, trigger, yes. trigger hairs are the definition of what's inside, you know, but, but starting from like, like what, <laughs> Venus yeah. to say, you know, why and what, and how do they, how do they, you know, know, quote unquote, like how to close when do they, sometimes they don't close, sometimes they do, like, why is that? And, you know, there's actually a logical sequence and like sketching out, um, I got to sketch out 
uh, diagrams essentially um, for, I wasn't, I wasn't doing the art for them, but I had to figure out what, um, what kind of base picture, a simple diagram, um, what would help communicate, uh, communicate it best to visitors. So I do my sketches with my writing and bring it down to the museum floor to like test with people and be like, what could be better? What could be yeah. clearer? What's working? Um, so yeah, like, like everything is a story. You could just, you could just learn the facts, um, but no one wants to read a dictionary yeah. and that is, it's not fun. <laughs> Why would you want to? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you capture them and part of capturing them is to is to say, wow, like just to put it out there, like look at the world we're living in. It's completely nutty, but let's explore it. <laughs> yes, completely nutty. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's perfect. It's, yeah. And having that viewpoint, because it is so easy to be like, I see these things every day, at least, at least in terms of things, you know, around you, uh, versus realizing things are very nutty and I have to, you just have to pay really close attention and you'll start seeing nutty things, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that's, and that's the exciting thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. We talked a little about art and the, and the sort of multimedia things you do. And I'm, I'm wondering about that, about, we talked about capturing people's attention. Why is it, do you think that art helps us helps draw people in helps open up those those worlds for people yeah I I mean I feel like this is too too academic of like there's different kinds of learners and some people like to mm -hmm. read and some people like to hear yeah. and you know so so not not quite that but it's it's about, I don't know, it's about style too. I mean, part of it is just like, is it aesthetically pleasing? Um, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But um, I think also like just communication is so much easier when you have multiple tools, right? So yeah. when you're able to pair the words with the images, whether you're making, say, I, I make a lot of um, videos and and video scripts and, and kind of animations. Um, and there's some things that are really hard to draw there's some things that are really hard to say but very easy to show you know those kind of things yes. like like they work so well together <laughs> you know like um having it's really hard to explain something you see only pictures and zero words completely it's kind of possible you yes. know and just like um yeah the the same thing about using only words to explain things it can it can be done but like pictures like it just they support each other they so much. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, that's my nature journals are so full of words. Um, and I think it leans towards more and more words, like all the time. Yeah. Okay. So how did you come to nature journaling? How did that world start opening yeah. up for you? Um, so after, so I, I grew up and lived around the Midwest in Chicago most of my life. And when I, um, when I knew I was leaving the field museum because of layoffs, um, I was starting to look for jobs that I was like anywhere out West, anywhere with no winter. I had recently taken like my first <laughs> ever cross, um, cross country road trip to places that weren't flat. <laughs> and I was just like, Oh my God, like I want to, I want to live out West somewhere. Um, so the, so my, my current job, the job I ended up moving to, uh, was the San Francisco, uh, Bay Area and part of my research of, you know, do I want to live in the city I have never been to is, um, okay, what kind of communi communities are there? Will I be able to find artists? Uh, you know, what's the science community like? And, um, and yeah, so just seeing all, you know, just kind of researching and being like, oh, there's a, there's a plain air group, right, right in the, in the suburbs that I could go to. So like landscapes outside, that could be cool. And then I was like, oh, wow, there's this science art group it's like the, the nature journal club i'm like oh this sounds like my type of people i would love yeah like i would love to draw with with scientists or thinking about science i was like oh that's cool so yeah there was a bunch of things uh that drew me wow. to wanting to live in san francisco but right off the bat i was like yeah i want to i want to check out that um so my first about year of living in san francisco um I didn't have access to a car. I was mainly doing things via public transit. So I keep hearing about these events and being like, oh, I, oh, I can't get there easy. Should I go to this? I'm like, oh, should I really rent a car? And so I think, I think um, it was many months in until I started going to my first ones and I actually flipped through my sketchbooks. Uh, early today, I was like, when, when were my like first times with the Nature Journal community? Um, and I was like, okay, right. They were at like one local museum and um, 
specifically there was a uh john muir laws um also known as uh, jack laws was was teaching um teaching about how to draw mushrooms to people who weren't necessarily artists it was like a mushroom club um in san francisco and i was like oh cool I like mushrooms <laughs> and yeah. I've been like dying to dying to um to, to meet this person or, or hear more about this science art club. Um so so yeah, I went to that. Um and that was really fascinating. It was it was a lot about um technique and how to like capture mushrooms, but um there was an interesting thing that I was noticing of like he's giving he's he's more than talking about technique, he's talking a little bit about like though how why is that behind that or here's a good way to remember that or like you know commonalities between other things and it wasn't just about the paint and the value and and that kind of thing and i was like huh that's this is really interesting you know i also learned that day that he was an educator and he actually had like his own science curriculum and i was like whoa you know like i was cre you know I'm, i create science curriculum so i was like oh that's so fascinating so um so yeah and the next time i saw him was like um at a at a museum drawing in an aquarium he's teaching us like about drawing fish and everything but the um and what i what i ended up doing there i had never seen a sea dragon before this this oh man creature that i don't i don't know if it's related to um seahorses but has some has some similarity with seahorses except they camouflage and they have like all these different not fins but like these fin like things coming oh, yeah. off their body in like every direction and it was so cool and also i was like <laughs> how in the world am i gonna draw this thing um so when when because i was like i can't even tell where these different like appendages like attached to the body so what i ended up doing was drawing like this kind of stick figure of it it was just like a line of where all the attachment ones and okay that one's ahead of that one before that one and then and then I did some like color studies of it and patterns and it was really cool um and I think um kind of at the end of the day um Jack has like everyone who who was there kind of like looking at each other's art we just lay it all out and you know see what ideas you know we can we can steal as in like let's share yes. and what can we learn from each other <laughs> um and yeah and um it was just interesting because Jack was kind of interested in like this, this kind of stick figure um, diagram kind of thing that I made, you know, which was like, oh, okay, I didn't know if anyone <laughs> didn't really think anyone would be interested in this, you know, compared to all these other, you know, very nice fish drawing and, and other things, you know. Um, so yeah, that that was really interesting to me. And the more and more I was able to join them, um, especially once I was able to get out um, in nature with them and not just kind of... Um, in inside museums and and stuff um it was so exciting um and the first time i really got to spend time um and actually what before flipping through my uh sketchbooks today what i thought was the first time that i had met um jack in the nature journal club was this three-day little vacation trip um that you could sign up for um at a national seashore like an hour from san francisco and i was like "Ooh, okay this is this is like worth the money to rent a car this is like three days this is gonna be great um and so so yeah i i signed up for that and drove out and met you know met some of the people i still know today um along with jack um marley piper and fiona gilligley and beth gilligley and like just it was so fun oh man it like the conversations and the the people you meet yeah. um are just so great and being inspired by each other and like um one night i think marley and jack and i and maybe fiona jack jack was talking about something like down by the lake i've been here before and there's like some i can't remember like frog creature there's there's something really cool going on in that and marley was like let's go let's see if we can find you know and so um <laughs> we just ran out and took flashlights and i didn't know these people at all and it was so great and they you know we're like little kids like looking in the mud right yes. <laughs> like i said like you can crawl around in dirt when you're a kid and when you're a nature yeah. or you also crawl around in dirt and it's so fantastic and so really just, you know, all the enthusiasm from, from that day and looking back at that sketchbook. And um, one day yeah. it was very rainy. Uh, so we were like, okay, we can't draw outside. And so Jack was like, I have, you know, I have a bunch of kind of talks that I, I give. So I have all that material. So actually let's, you know, let's do a few of these. And so one he did was kind of on, um, on, on some, you know, helpful techniques perhaps. Um, but then um, the things that started to blow my mind were things where, he, one of the lectures of like how to how to not just like draw like an artist but to think like an artist or or you know getting at like all these different techniques of hey you can use 
zoom ins or can you use numbers or can you, you know, and just like this toolkit of things that were so helpful that I was like, maybe I'm using some of that, but like, oh my gosh. And I remember some of the things were like solving problems that I had just experienced. I had just like been painting with a, with a, a landscape group in San Francisco, a fantastic group um, that's that's mainly interested in making, you know, like beautiful art and, and pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's so something technically I've never done. I've never done landscapes before. So it was challenging and fun. And I was trying to, I was painting a landscape, not, not very well. And also being really frustrated because there was like this cool tree, like very far away. And I kept trying to give it a lot of detail and like, which would ruin the depth of the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it didn't make sense. And I was kind of like, but I love that tree so much, but okay. I also am trying to capture a seat, you know, and then Jack was talking about like, you know, you can do things like call outs and zoom ins. And I was like, Oh, I need zoom ins yes. in my artwork. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Oh, perfect. And so like just giving all these tools and like really exploring, I think, curiosity and um mm -mm. probably some like questions for for the first time uh with that group and just really hanging out for a few days um with some you know avid and uh, uh nutty nature journalers perhaps looking at all the <laughs> nutty things around just just so uh yeah so so inspiring and then soon after that um i was able to attend the nature journal club um regularly like like every month whenever there was a, an event so that was just uh just yeah the the monthly the monthly uh, what is the last sunday of every month like adventure mm -hmm. that was just uh so impactful i think to my life and not just not just my art um yeah for the for the six or so years that i got to live in san francisco yeah. mm -mm. that story just makes me smile so much i I just feel like it's so exciting to find the people that will <laughs> crawl around in the mud with you and uh -huh ask these questions and explore these art things, these science things. It's so exciting to, to find those people. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it was like, it was like field notes kind of from, you know, from the, from the museum scientists. I was always interested in like their, yeah. their notebooks, which you don't, I didn't get to see them, but you know, you'd look at kind of older okay yes scientific illustrations but more like field notes about behavior and stuff mm -hmm. and it was just so exciting to find um to find a community where it's like you don't have to be a scientist like anyone yeah. can take part in this and it all just starts with questions and curiosity um and I I love not knowing the answer <laughs> to things I love it I don't <laughs> I'll like I would have I don't know been like telling my my boss at my current job um who's a total science dork about like something I did, um, something I saw that weekend and was drawing about and journaling about and like, oh, I wonder what's going on. And, you know, he might like start to tell me, I'd be like, do, do not tell me the answer, dog. Like, I don't <laughs> want to know. Like, there's still so, cause, uh, like, yeah, you just come mystery. back to it. Yeah. Again and again. Yeah. These open mysteries that like you, I'd find clues like later yeah. that I don't know. Yes. Sometimes I don't have specific questions. Sometimes I do, but like you connect the dots later and it's really fun, like to, to figure some things out yourself, you know? Yes. Um, so, and then there, there's the balance of sometimes, well, more information will, will bring you down paths you didn't previously think of. So sometimes I'd be like, like, can, can, you know, can I have a, like a clue? <laughs> like, can you tell me like a little bit about that? Like, you know, and so I'd be like, I need something else to think about, but I don't want to know exactly yeah. what the answer to my question is yet. But, but yeah, so <laughs> a lot That's of my so pages. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I have people in workshops wonder about the value of questions that are unanswered. And I, mm. and I always tell them, well, there's value in questioning because it trains the brain, but also when you question something and you take that moment to write it in your journal, you're sort of flagging it for future you. And then you come, like you said, you often come around to it again and you'll see something in a different situation that will, that will trigger you and, and you can go, ah, oh, it can be an aha moment, but a year or two years down the line, because you've written that down, you're flagging it in your own brain. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, writing being so tied to memory and stuff, which is so fun. I, I also enjoy writing questions and then taking guesses <laughs> at why yes. it could be and, and like trying that. to like think of as many, maybe it's this, maybe it's this 
and like thinking of multiple reasons why it could be. You can get silly, you could be more serious, but like essentially like the more things you think of and the more things you're open to, well, like, hey, maybe the more likely you're kind of going to be close with the answer, you know, like just, just come up with yeah. everything you can think of. And then um, like Fiona Gilligley makes these, oh, I don't know what she calls them, but they're like, they're like question, question chain. chains. Yes, question yeah. chain. Yeah, of just more and more and more questions. And so doing that is so, so fun. Yeah. And I used to do that to like a smaller extent. And then like seeing Fiona's art, like making me like go even deeper. And that's that's <laughs> often why my page is like so full of words often because I'm like asking more and more questions and thinking through theories. And then do like, I love doodling or like diagramming what the theory is of like maybe it's this maybe it's that and like trying to explain it to myself like does that make sense I don't know but that would be cool you know um so yeah yeah questions and um not needing to know the answers really uh is really powerful I think about nature journaling yeah so let's talk about doodling because you're really well yeah. known in the nature journal community for teaching people to doodle diagrams yeah. and I wonder if you came to this sort of style because of your history of um, teaching science. H how did the doodling diagrams thing start? Yeah, um, yeah, you know, people asked me this previously, and like I, I didn't make all the connections that over the years I'm kind of like, oh right, I used to do that kind of diagrams. Oh right, so so ha having thought back at it, like I've always been interested in like. Kind of the visual language of things like mm. math. Um, I, I mentioned like in college, I'd make a lot of art about math kind of things. Um, and then also um, at, when I was creating, helping to, to create a show on biomechanics um, at, at the Field Museum, I mentioned that like part of that was was diagrams, right? And And just seeing like the, the less realistic the pictures are that go with your diagrams, like the more effective they often are because you're yes. stripping out, you're just showing the information you need. So like you need to be able to draw attention to whatever it is that you're talking about. So, um, and there's different ways, you know, you could start with very realistic and then, and then simplify it. There's all, you know, like these kind of more doodly or simplified things can be, you know, it's just one tool among many. You don't only have to do it, but like, um, yeah, kind of getting down to the, to the simpler things and learning how to draw attention of like, this this little uh, little thing that looks like a hair, a little trigger hair in the Venus flytrap. Like, where are those? Well, they're just they're very hard to see in a photograph, you know, or in a you know, and thus like a realistic painting or drawing. But if you simplify it, it's like, oh, okay, I know where to look. There they are. There's the six things now. Oh, and now yes. I can recognize them in the photo, right? So so simplifying something and making it look less realistic um, can can be really important to explaining things or even um, kind of noticing things and trying to explain them or notice things on your on your own too even if you don't know the answer like I was saying if you're just kind of trying to show or draw the you know behavior or, or movement mm -hmm. or something so yeah I got I got really excited about that through a field museum show all about animals and plants in motion um and then like this uh there's like there was a story about a snake that that glides through the air um like a like a sugar glider or something and it's just like what um yes. and then I knew the answer, obviously, because I talked to the scientists, but then it's like, okay, how do I get across that answer? And it's this crazy thing where they, um, that their rib cage is almost like a hinge and that they can, they can open up their ridge cage, which makes the snake wider and flatter and a bit more like a wing. Right. And so, so I start with that knowing I need, I need to explain this in, in a kind of museum graphic. And then you have to think about like, okay, yes, words, and then visuals, and how do, like, what angles am I showing? Where am I starting? Like, you know, I need to so show a cross-section of, of the ribs, but starting there is very confusing. You know, maybe maybe I do that whole snake, and then you, you know, do the zoom in, which I needed for my landscape tree, whatever, you know, the zoom in, yes. uh, to, okay, this is this part of the snake, and then this is how it looks like before it opens its, uh, <laughs> you know, opens its rib cage, and this was what it looks after, and then, oh, look at the similarities between that shape and the shape of another generic thing that flies or glides, um, like a wing. So, so yeah, getting getting to and being able to show that to people and get feedback on it, right? About what's what could be better and what, um, yes. yeah, is I mean absolutely how you learn, uh, and it's great talking to people about how they learn, cause, yeah, because you'll you'll think something is right and then you'll 
talk to people and you're like, oh, this could be so much better. <laughs> like this, I love yeah. feedback. I love getting feedback or collaborating or yeah, um, hearing about <laughs> what other, you know, seeing other people's journal pages on the same thing that maybe you were doing but yeah. totally different ways. Uh, or like, you know, Jack's saying like stealing ideas from people and just sharing, uh, sharing resources and different ways, you know, uh, adding different things to your like toolkit uh, is so, yeah, so exciting. Yeah, so you did, uh, you gave a workshop on doodling diagrams for the Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference this year, and I loved it. And one of the one of the ones that I want to steal from your toolbox, <laughs> I don't. Um, Melinda Nakagawa talks about harvesting. I think this is a much um, gentler. <laughs> I like I like the jokiness of stealing. Like let's steal. I I I like that because it is like. For some people, art is extremely precious and it is like, this yeah, is my yeah, idea. Yeah. I did it yeah, first. You're right. I'm going to be famous because it's mine. <laughs> Whereas like it, like, let's, you know, let's share. <laughs> like some people yeah. see it as stealing, but like stealing from other yeah. artists is not a bad thing. That's how you learn. Like drawing someone and it's else's absolutely, art. Yeah. yeah, it's how art is made. You know, if you look at really famous artists, artists or musicians sometimes you see the influences or where they've taken their idea and you can see oh yeah that's stealing in inverted commas but <laughs> right um, right they've, <laughs> they've turned it into their own thing so the thing that I want to steal from you is that uh, you had this amazing diagram where uh, you were turning over logs and there was all these oh, yes. critters under the log and then to really effectively show the difference in the speed of these critters you use little um speedometer speed dials uh illustrated speed dials I thought that was genius and I love that I want definitely want to take that um for my journal but you had so many beautiful ways of explaining how to doodle diagrams and I love this there's you know lots of use of arrows lots of use of uh, a sequence of drawings but I love that you've just got all these different things that you can pull out for the different situations for expressing movement or uh, change in some way Thank you. Yeah. And it was, it was really fun to put together because he, first I just like, you know, flipped through a good 20 of my sketchbooks and being like, what do I do? Yeah. Like what, you know, cause sometimes these things are like subconscious or you've done them for so many, I don't know, years in some format that you're not thinking about them. And it's really, really fun to again, reflect on like, how can I teach this to someone else? And why would anyone yes. even want to learn it? Like, it's just the same kind of thing. So it was really exciting to even make the workshop because I love thinking about yes. how people learn and where I should start with this and like why would I even want to doodle a diagram or where you know like maybe I'll start with the arrow or like just looking yeah. looking at all the different things and like how can it build on each other there's so many things how do I even curate this down to the few I want to talk about um yeah. and what was really fun was um kind of I have a lot of kind of drawing prompts throughout the workshop so um mm -hmm and just kind of scaffolding those like how do you give to not enough information where people know what they're doing but so it doesn't feel like they're just copying exactly what you just did and everything and which is uh, something we think a lot about when like making curriculum and ac activities mm -hmm. um for you know uh, kindergarten through fifth graders um so yeah i love making activities and thinking through kind of instructions and stuff so it was very fun um to even yeah think about putting that together and, and reflecting on like what do I do? Why do I do it? Um, it's, yes. it's very valuable and very like you, you know, you learn things about yourself when you have to put together a workshop like that. Yeah. Yeah. And you said in the workshop that sometimes, and this is a big problem in the nature journal community that sometimes we get fixated on art and you, and, you know, making something pretty, making something look exactly as it is. And you said sometimes art can distract us from being curious. And I love that, that mm -hmm. phrasing, because it's true. We can, we can get focused on something and then forget about the wonder, about the question, all that stuff, and that doodling can help us engage. And I, I wonder if you could expand on that, on your thoughts about how doodling helps us engage. Yeah. Um, I mean, as far as, yeah, focusing so much on the art, I know I – you can you can really zone out in in a, in a mm. fun way where you're just thinking all about um, the techniques and like how to get the values or the the perspective right or um, the colors and kind of the 
the ways you're going to capture that thing, perhaps like realistically, um, whereas you're really focused on the techniques, um, which can be very, very fun. And I've, you know, done a lot of in <laughs> throughout, through my, my uh, you know, art uh, career. I don't know if mm -hmm. I should call it a career, but essentially, um, yeah, when you're thinking, so I found at least personally for myself, when I'm thinking so much about making something look, say, realistic and focused on techniques, it's just there's not too much room in my brain for, for taking in all the other things. Um, so, yeah, so I'm interested like a lot now in like animals' behavior and stuff. But if you're just mm -hmm. trying to draw it realistically, there's not too much room for that too. And also like writing writing down what what uh, what you see and what you think. I mean, like you're actively doing that. Like you cannot yeah. <laughs> write and draw at the same time. You know, like you have to choose. Maybe things <laughs> are happening very fast. Um, so so yeah, my pages tend to be um, really full of words. But uh, I definitely, I you know, I've explored the the. The technical area so much too that it, it was also like a a great change uh for me something i was like ready to dive into and then kind of mm -hmm. really really appreciating um kind of the nature journaling thought that like you know it's not it doesn't have to be about pretty pictures um yeah. which is yeah. which is really really not or you're not going to be critiqued um you know after being in art school the art school i was at was actually um <laughs> completely against pretty pictures um actually they're like if you can hang it on your wall we don't want it at this college Let's get out. Uh, <laughs> this was the school of the art institute of chicago and i i did i made all my art about like it was like survey based and stuff it wasn't any visual at all um but yeah right at the end of end of um going to school i did some scientific illustration classes which were great fun at the museum and that of course was was getting a very beautiful but realistic picture um and it was really cool um i was drawing taxidermy um uh, amazing taxidermy animals and it was so fun to learn how to capture them realistically and refining that um but yeah kind of kind of realizing i remember i remember like a picked this one bird like a spoonbill from this giant hall of birds when there's like hundreds and I was like oh because its beak is so interesting but um you know I spent so much time focused on like getting it to look right I don't even know how much I thought about like well why does it have that shape of a beak you know <laughs> you know um yeah. now now that was like still taxidermy you know so there's also there's less to observe and that like you can't see how mm -hmm. they move you can't see you can't hear them etc but like yeah once you once you get out in nature look at animals it's both incredibly frustrating because they move and like trying to draw them is a uh, crazy time it's like really like just it's you know if you if you try to do realistic <laughs> pictures of moving things you will drive yourself crazy if you want to be realistic um so so part of it is that but also like yeah. just really freeing that like I don't you know I'm I'm not even really interested in capturing things realistically um anymore I feel like that's not what I get most out of nature journaling mm -hmm. um at all so so yeah my my pages do go a lot towards um words or kind of like yeah like doodles I do I do like the challenge of like getting things getting the proportions right and stuff sometimes so sometimes it is more um ac accurate and such and yet um yeah it's kind of because I want to <laughs> because I want to know like oh, its legs are so long and its body is skinny or that's where it attaches here. And like, that gives you information yes. in a way. So there's also, yeah, there's there's all sorts of ways to that, uh, you know, realism can be effective too. But um, yeah, when you're really trying to, when you focus on, on something that, um, you know, like the Venus flytrap and the little details that would be so hard to to see if you weren't simplifying things or like, you know, it really helps you zone in and zoom into just what you're interested in. Like, why is this animal behaving that way? Well, you you might end up drawing very differently if you're thinking about behavior versus versus just how it looks. Aesthetics. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. So you've recently moved back to a region where you grew up and you're developing a new relationship with this place. And I'd love to hear more about that. Yes. Um, so I grew up um, in the Midwest, uh, in the suburbs of Chicago, and I lived in and around there um, for all of my life until I was about um, 25 when I moved out to San Francisco and started nature journaling, et cetera. Um, and I really grew to hate the Midwest, um, the snow, uh, the cold weather, the what I considered very boring and dull nature once I had experienced other nature just being like so flat, <laughs> there's nothing around here. 
and really you do there's a lot of urban sprawl around chicago and there's there's places but it it is absolutely hard, a little harder uh, to find things um but but yeah in uh, my husband and I decided to move away from San Francisco and we're looking at all over the country of where to live and we're still affordable, et cetera. What do we want? Um, and decided to move uh, about two hours uh, to three hours from where we grew up, which is um, capital of Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and part of that was a choice that there was more nature in the immediate area. There's even a few hills around here, <laughs> but um, it still is, you know, it still is very similar to the nature um, that I grew up in, um, grew up with. And I was kind of excited about moving here, but also a little scared that, you know, the the weather, the snow is going to make mm. me really depressed again. Or I was just like, you know, after the beauty, after the beauty of San Francisco and the diversity of habitats and stuff, it is hard to compete. And I knew I wasn't going to get that again, but also like, yeah. And even like, um, there's not a nature journal community here right now. Mm -hmm. So like, will I still nature journaling? Was it mainly a social thing for me? Will I be motivated to do this? Geez, I hope it's still in my life. I don't know. Um, and so, oh, I've just, I've just found it so fun here after moving here of just, getting to see sometimes like the very familiar stuff that I might have grown up with, but like geeking out over it and seeing it in a whole different way. Like I think nature journaling just changes, changes how you look at the, or the, the things that you notice, um, just all yeah. the little things you notice. I'm obsessed with squirrels right now. Like, oh my gosh, they're just such chaos creatures. They're so fantastic. Um, and, or like the little, all the summer I collected seed pods. It's like, it's like all I did this seed, cut, seed pods and like <laughs> cicada shells and all the different types of kind of cicada shells and how, how, how dead it was. Like, you know, like what, you know, there was a dead one, but is that its shell or is it not its shell? I think that, uh, oh, yes. this one's a little different. Mm -hmm. Oh, this one's a little different. Oh, weird. I know, you know, I think they're exoskeletons, but this one obviously isn't, or is it that way, you know, and just kind of all these, yeah, everything's so curious and and even in the winter like there are it, i've learned to deal with the cold um you know like now that um you know really really buying uh expensive winter gear really is the key <laughs> some mm -hmm. some things the expense actually matters and the quality so that's been uh good to learn but uh but yeah as long as it's warmish outside like the the or you can even if it's freezing outside as long as long as you're warmish when you're outside um yeah, yeah, the things the things in winter are so fascinating, and it's so easy to see it as all kind of dead or like sleeping. Um, be, primarily because you know all the all the leaves are gone from the trees and things like look dead. But it's so it's also so exciting to be like, what are all the things that are not dead? Like, there's so much interesting <laughs> yeah. thing. Or like, if things some things have died, like, ooh, <laughs> how did they die? Or like, you know that they're just they're not they're like temporarily uh you know it's kind of like a superpower when trees lose their leaves totally. because they're actually doing it to like save themselves energy and all of a sudden you know and like ooh, when are they going to bloom or um or you know uh get leaves again i when i was collecting things like cicada shells um or exoskeletons or sometimes just dead ones i don't, I don't know why but um what the difference was or why they died but anyway yeah when i was at the same time when I was like um, collecting insects and everything, um, later later in the fall when it was starting to become cold, I found a dead caterpillar outside. These really cute caterpillars that I knew when I was a kid, I saw them around school. They're called uh, generically like woolly bears, so woolly and they're brown and black. And I was like, oh, here's a dead one. But also yay, because now I can bring it inside and I can, <laughs> I can uh, have it as part of my collection. And so, and then, uh, <laughs> it was all like curled up and like, you know, some insects do when they die and so cute. And then the next day it was just moving. And I was like, this is not a dead it was, caterpillar. It was just cold. Oh, <laughs> yes. I was like, wait, what do caterpillars like hibernate or something? Like what is going on? And then I was like, geez, I hope I didn't ruin his, his whatever cycle. I was <laughs> like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. But also I was like, I had no idea um, that, that, you know, I was very much assuming that like butterflies and moths, like all had very similar life patterns. And then you realize like, not necessarily at all. Yeah. So yeah, there's this, I put them back outside uh, or her. Uh, and I know, I know where I put it. I checked the other day. It's not, it's not there, but uh, who knows wow. maybe. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so like little magic things like that. Um, and then also I'm 
I'm doing a bigger project right now where um, since there's uh, there's not a nature journal club here, I've been doing a lot of my nature journaling uh, through the Audubon events. So um, different mm -hmm. bird focused events, or they also um, organize things about like uh, monarchs around here and prairies. So other, other important things to our ecosystem here. Um, so I just bring my journal and draw during all of their events. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, that's my time. I like, I like having yeah. time set aside, which was very helpful for me to get into a habit and drawing with other nature journalers. So um, there's, there's a few less, uh, it's a bit less frequent to have uh, events in the winter. Uh, they try, we do, um, but, but also one of the, the winter thing, citizen science projects I saw coming up um, was monitoring bald eagle nests. So I signed up to monitor a bald eagle's nest. I've been doing it for about four weeks now um, and we'll be doing it for an hour a week and like through July. Um, what do you have to I monitor? Am... Do you, coming yes. and going of the birds? Yes. So, um, so it's, there's a, there's a giant nest um, in a tree on the side of a marsh and I'm, I, there's a confidentiality agreement. I cannot tell anyone where it is, um, cool. but essentially I, there's, there's certain data that data that they want us to collect as in um, like our, are the adults even perching on the tree? You know, are they present? Mm -hmm. Are they in the nest? Are um, are they eating? Are did they are they building the nest? Um, you can tell. Um, th this is this is a circumstance where like I had to know a lot of the answers right away. I couldn't, yes, you know, yes, I couldn't yes. let all my curiosity go wild. So you know, they showed <laughs> us like when the bald eagles are kind of sitting at different heights in the nest. You can actually tell of like the lower is when there's eggs still, and then after they've hatched to not squish their little babies, they're like up slightly higher. So like wow. you're looking for all these details, um, and then specifically uh, the times that that any of these things happen. Um, and then once, uh, you know, once the babies hatch, there's um, data to collect uh, around that as well. But um, one thing that's been- Does it so all go in your, sorry, go on, go on. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> if, well, predicting what you were gonna ask, it does all go in my nature journal. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm kind of, yeah. And so I've also realized that um, it's really interesting because uh, there's, there's, uh, I'm like, actually, maybe I can't say that anyway, um, near this, near this nest, like I'm sitting mm -hmm. in a place that, you know, it's the middle of winter when I'm starting and I moved here recently. This is my first winter. I've only lived here like eight months. Um, and like, it's not just the nest that, and the eggs that are going to change, like everything around me is going to come back to life. Yeah. I have no idea what yeah. any of these plants look like right now. They're just like dead and they crunch when the wind blows and most of them, you know, and just kind of realizing, oh man, like, I'm going to observe everything changing over the next six months. And so I started taking, I'm taking all of my own data too about the plants and are there insects and what other creatures am I looking at? What does this look like right now? Um, and so, yeah, so I'm, I, I have an official like kind of online sheet that I, you know, fill out every week, but all of my data is in nature journal format. Um, I, there's a lot of question chains. There's a lot of like arrow moving, you know, arrow diagram, path diagrams that they call it. Like um, the other day, um, yeah, A1, adult one, who knows if it was a male or female, was like, you know, flying towards this way and doing some loops. And so I was, uh, you know, doing some diagrams of him and just, or her and uh, just, yeah, there's there's so many questions. The first two weeks I there, I, I was there, they weren't even there. I didn't see them for like three weeks, but even that is kind of interesting. Like, what are they out doing? You know, like things that could see very boring, like the absence of things is can actually be really interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know, that kind of that kind of stuff. So I'm really excited about seeing how the entire landscape um, changes. Um, and also, I mean, part of this is a strategy to force myself to be outside, make sure that even if it's cold, I'm getting out there. Um, but which actually I had no problem doing. I'm always I'm always outside. It's great. Um, but yeah, so this I'll I'll start. I'm really bad at sharing my work. I'll start, I'll start, I'll start posting some of this stuff <laughs> online. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, all, all the data taking is really fun. Um, and it was a, it's a fun, like, page layout thing. I made, like, a little template of, like, may, it'd be nice if things were kind of consistently in the same place on the pages as you flip through. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I pre-thought a little bit of a loose structure to kind of repeat, which I was like, this is really, this is really fun, because then I can glance and see kind of some data over time. Um, there, San Francisco being having very mild weather and like these 
really weird seasons and it seems like all the all the plants are on their own different seasons and you know things are so strange um when you don't have like four seasons but <laughs> but being back here in the in Wisconsin in the Midwest um you know the seasonal changes are so obvious too um so it's it's really made me excited about comparing and contrasting things over time mm-hmm. uh, so that's it's just going to kind of become a natural theme you know <laughs> it has to naturally um but then I've started labeling my sketchbooks um I always put the date somewhere, but like labeling them very clearly on the outside by mm. month so that I can, you know, Ooh. next, next one, yeah. next January, I can look back. Um, That's and juicy. Trying to, Yay, I like that. Yeah. And trying to do some really long-term things. I'm really interested in squirrel nests. So all the, the, all the main trees I can see from my house's windows, I have drawn them and plotted where the squirrel nests are this year and then I have a bunch of questions about them and the next year I'm going to see if they're in the same place this is like a very slow moving progress where I'll <laughs> you know I'll collect data like a year from now and then see what happens in the next year it's like hopefully as you know as long as I remember that I even have this but um but it's fun and I'm doing like oh I could like glue in some transparent pages maybe the Maybe the base will be like a pen tree, but you know, the data can be on in different ways. I'm like, this is really interesting. Yeah. I've never done like long-term projects. So just thinking about, you know, <laughs> even more creativity, the new ch- next challenge, the new challenge um, of yeah, new, new things to think about. Um, so, so yeah, I'm having um, it's, you know, I'll, I'll always love and appreciate my time in San Francisco so much. Um, the, the amazing diversity of wildlife there and habitats just so cool um and of course there's a there's a, a very large nature journal club there but um mm-hmm. i'm slowly working on uh getting my own um art community together here there's actually a lot of art communities but i'm trying to specifically focus on nature drawing and i i have a long-term uh strategy <laughs> i know i know how i'm going about it and it's just like in its beginning stages but it's starting to like come together just a little so i'm super excited so um, yeah so yeah. i love that i love that nature journaling the the lens of nature journaling is in is helping you see your the nature you knew in a whole new way it's beautiful mm-hmm. and it sounds like you've just got it scope for so many projects down the years <laughs> yeah yeah and it's you know I I found the answer to my to my question of like you know am I going to be motivated will I still do this yes. and I'm like I'm so glad <laughs> that yeah. even alone I am you know so motivated yeah. um to continue nature journaling it just seems like it's a very permanent part of my life now which is which is great I can't escape it and it can't escape me so it's great yeah Amy thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing your stories you've got so much so many amazing stories I've I've been smiling I've had my mouth drop open it's it's been so good to talk to you yeah it's been so fun to meet you Bethan and chat um this is great thanks thanks so much uh for having me on your show I didn't I didn't listen to too many other podcasts be before this because like is it gonna make me nervous and then really in the last yeah, couple of days yeah, i was like yeah. nah it's not gonna make me nervous and now i've been like <laughs> watching all of them and some of my friends have been interviewed i was like oh i gotta listen to gargies and I, yeah and so i'm so excited to continue to to follow your podcast and go through the archives um and yeah it's just, it's been uh it's been so great meeting you and getting to to be on the podcast so thanks so much I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Amy. This was one of those chats that left me with such a buzz. I feel ready to go out with my nature journal and try to simplify patterns and movement and whatever other complex things I can find to put down in the form of a diagram. I hope you're feeling inspired too. And if you want to learn more about Amy, visit the show notes for this episode where you'll find a link to her website and her social media links and you can also see a YouTube video where Amy presents her doodling diagrams workshop. It's super fun and inspiring and definitely takes the fear out of nature journaling really complicated things. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. (music) 